Well, good morning. good morning to our um, members and friends who are watching us at their residence. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. To those who are here and worship today, let us rejoice and worship our God. No matter who, no matter what, no matter where you are on life journey, you are welcome here at Bloomfield Congregational Church. My name is Carolyn Young, and I am your guest minister for this Sunday. I know that we have at least one announcement, and that I ask you to please to include Al Forster's his friends, and those he loved in your prayers in this service as he has just recently passed. There will be a slide in our announcement about it. Thank you very much. Are there any other announcements that I need to be aware of? Okay, if not, let us continue with our call to worship. Deep calls to deep. And in the depths, there is God. Beneath the storm and rapids in our day, there is God. Beneath the waves of demands and expectations, there is God. There, there is God. God is always with us. Though there are times we are blind to the divine presence, deep calls to deep. Remind us to be still and know that God is our opening hymn.
with our unison prayer. On this day, we gather here to be found by your love, for on our own, we cannot find you. If Help us to know deeply your presence, especially in these days of war and violence. Strengthen our faith, hope, and love that we might truly become your disciples, working with you to repair the brokenness of the world. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Let us offer each other the sign of the peace of Christ. To you at home to you here. Our children message. Wisdom. God's wisdom. We have wisdom, right? We sure do. And God has wisdom. You know, God's wisdom is something that we find daily, but we don't always see it at the time. We struggle with things. Summer, can you come up? We have struggles in our life. And sometimes, sometimes, things look upside down, right? I want you to look in there, and what do you see? Me upside down. You upside down, right? You look in a spoon, it's upside down. With God, now what do you see? Me right side up. Are you right side up. That's right. God helps us every day turn things upside down to right side up. And that's what we need to focus on. It's hard. It's a hard time sometimes. But we need God to turn things right side up. Children, are you ready to go?
Amen again. <laughs> that was beautiful. I was sitting there thinking, why don't I just stay in this moment? Then I said, get up, woman. You got to preach. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's time for prayer. And as I mentioned, we are praying for the family and friends of Elf Forster, who passed recently. But I'm sure you have your own prayers, and there will be a time where you will be able to offer up your individual prayers to God uh, in the silent recesses of your heart. Oh, loving God, we gather here today on the third Sunday of Lent in the midst of so many disturbing troubles. We wish that we could block them all out and simply concentrate on the joy of this day. For indeed, it is a joy for the congregation as well as for me, but you call us to live in the real world, not a fabricated one, where troubles and sufferings are denied or ignored. And so we pray for the world as we find it, a world of stunning sunrises and sunsets, of children's laughter and ever-expanding vista of knowledge, but also a world where war is raging in Ukraine and evil is asserting its ugly grip. We pray for our world in all its struggle, not only for the people of Ukraine, but also for others in places that do not know peace. Syria, the Congo, Afghanistan, Sudan, and Yemen, and also our country, where too many cities face gun violence every day. We pray for all those places, and we ask you to strengthen our hands, that we might truly be instruments of your peace and goodwill. We lift up to you, all persons of goodwill who are working to make the world a more just and righteous place. We are thankful for people who are helping refugees taking people into their own homes, giving them food and respite. We pray for churches everywhere, which are trying to do the will of Christ in both small and large ways. Churches in our own denomination, as well as all the many varieties across the landscape of our world. We pray for those of other faiths and even no faith, for we believe that you make yourself known in a variety of ways. So help the people of this world to recognize your truth and your love wherever you make it known. Today, we also pray for our enemies, whether they are personal or global. For we know that this is what you command us to do. We pray for those caught in evil's tightening grip in the hope that your love and mercy can loosen the bonds that hold them. Soften the hearts, the hardened hearts, and still the raging of the storm that leads people astray. 
as much as we may harbor deep resentment and even hatred toward Putin, we pray for him that his mind and heart will be turned away from the evil path he is pursuing. Oh God, why must his free will be allowed to destroy the lives and free wills of others? Grant wisdom and understanding to leaders everywhere that they might be able to find a new path toward peace. In the quiet recesses of your heart, offer up your individual petition to God. In the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, usually using these familiar words, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now is the space where we hear God's word, for God is still speaking to us. This morning, Ooh. The, the Reverend Carolyn Young has chosen her readings from the message version of the Bible, which sounds like ordinary people talking. Today's reading from Job has Job complaining to his three friends who have been insisting that the reason for his suffering is because of something he has done. He must be guilty of a wrong, they said. Job does not embrace their argument and tells them he is broken and hopeless. Listen now for God's word as it comes to us in the book of Job, chapter 17, verses 10 through 16. Maybe you would all like to start over, to try it again, the bunch of you. So far, I haven't come across one scrap of wisdom in anything you've said. My life's about over. All my plans are shattered. All my hopes are snuffed out. My hope that night would turn into day, my hope that dawn was about to break. If all I have to look forward to is a home in the graveyard, if my only hope is the comfort of a well-built coffin, if my family reunion means going six feet under and the only family that shows up is worms, do you call that hope? Who on earth could find any hope in that? No. If Hope and I are to be buried together, I suppose you'll all come to the double funeral. As we continue, in 1 Corinthians, the first chapter, the 18th through the 21st verses. The reading from the New Testament comes from Paul's letter to the Christian church. In the Greek city of Corinth, Paul lifts up the cross of Christ, which to the world looks like sheer foolishness and stupidity. But God's ways are not, our, are not the world ways, and we are once again reading from the message version. The message that point to Christ on the cross seems like sheer silliness to those hell-bent on destruction. But for those on the way of salvation, it makes perfect sense. This is the way God works, and most powerfully as it turns out. It is written, 
and I'll turn conventional wisdom on its head. I'll expose so-called experts as shame, as shams. So where can you find someone truly wise, truly educated, truly intelligent in this day and age? Hasn't God exposed it all as pretentious nonsense? Since the world and all its fancy wisdom never had a clue when it came to knowing God. God in his wisdom took delight in using what the world considered stupid, preaching of all things, to bring those who trust him into the way of salvation. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. It can be trusted. Thanks be to God. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to thee, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Move from me any obstacle that prevent the truth of your words to be heard and understood. Amen. Well, first let me congratulate you that you are here. Some people play hooky when the pastor's not here. But you are here. So let us be prayerful that I have a sermon that has some truth of the Lord. A while back, I had the opportunity to stroll through a museum whose sole purpose was on the freedom of the press. It was playfully called Newsom. They had exhibits on just about every press-related story you could imagine. On every leap forward, and every boundary cross. But among the displays, there is one that I will never forget. After a long day of walking, I rounded a corner to find myself amid an installment of Pulitzer Prize photographs. It was this dimly lit, round gallery, inviting its guests to walk through a timeline prize, winning photographs, starting in 1942 and ending in the present. A large, embossed quote from Eddie Adams, who was a photographer, decorated the entrance wall and it's read, if we make you laugh, he wrote, if we make you cry, if, if it rips out your heart, that is a good picture. Now everyone who has ever been to a museum, especially a large one, know that there are some sections of the museum you just have to walk through at a brisk pace, skimming the surface and pausing every now and then. But this exhibit was different. This exhibit demanded that I stop and be still in reverence to pay a kind of homage to the vast spectrum of human joy and suffering. In some photographs, I saw scenes that radiate with hope and heroism. One feature a large 18 foot wheeler flying off a bridge while ordinary men and women gather around to pull the desperate driver to safety. It was incredible. 
There were one that showed lovers jumping into one another's arms after what must have been ages apart. There were Olympians ablaze with glory after performing feats previously considered superhuman. But each of these photographs had an opposite, the reverse side, the reverse side of those same coins. I was not prepared to see Vietnamese children naked and stumbling from their village, screaming from the napalm burns on their skin. I wasn't prepared to see Albanian parents desperately passing a frightened child the same age as my son through a barbed wire fence, trying to flee from a war in Kosovo. I wasn't prepared to see the fear on the faces of men and women with guns to their heads and photographs snap in the moments just before their lives ended. As I walked on, my senses of hope and optimism proved far more fragile than I have ever thought they would be. They shattered into pieces around me, cutting my feet as I walk. Hope, optimism, hope, optimism. But for all of the photographs I saw that day, there is one that slips unbidden into my thoughts most often. It was a piece called The Struggling Girl. Even though the child in the photograph was a boy, a young Sudanese boy, no older than three or four, hunger had eaten him to nothing. He had collapsed onto the ground. He was helpless and alone. Except for a vulture, two yards behind him, just waiting. After the photograph was published in the New York Times in 1993, the photographer, a man named Kevin Carter, was criticized for not reaching out and helping this child, for not picking him up and taking him to find food, for not letting him know for a moment that he wasn't alone. But Carter would admit that there was strict, that he was under strict instructions not to touch the children for fear of disease. Carter became so overwhelmed by the trauma of the experience, the hopelessness of the famine and war he had witnessed, that four months after receiving the Pulitzer Prize for that photograph, he took his own life. I felt hopeless as I looked at that child and read that story. It was my job, my vocation, to imagine hope, to preach hope, to trust hope. But at that moment, I realized that until we have looked 
at that kind of hopelessness, square in its eyes, there is nothing we have said about hope is worth a wet noodle. Of course, I thought of the story this week. We are witnessing a televised account of the brutal invasion against Ukraine. We are learning to wait expectantly and actively for Christ to show up. My favorite image for help comes from a bright divinity school emeritus professor of pastoral care. His name is Dr. Andrew Lester. He wrote that hope could be best understood in a language of story. He asserts that each of us is living a story, responding to the present, to some kind of perceived narrative trajectory of our past. But it's not just that. We don't often think about the fact that we are also living in response to the perceived narrative trajectory of our future. In other words, we each have a future story, the next chapter that we anticipate living into. We have an imagination of what might be coming tomorrow, next week, or next year. And when this imagined story is good, then we feel hope. When it is bad, we feel despair. Of course, as with any story, any story we tell, there is always the question of whether it is true. Are we living, really living in the story we thought we were living? Are we actually as helpless in the face of it as we think we are? Typically, especially during this warmongering, this pandemic, is the pastor's job to ask these questions, to help us reimagine our future in the light of God's story. God redemptive imagination. We draw pictures of the kind of future God imagines and say in the words of one of my friends, I know it's dark right now, but just believe somehow that soon there will be light. But today, but today, I want to ask a different kind of question. In some ways, a question we are more primed to answer this year than ever before in our lifetime. A question that the Sudanese boy will not let me ignore. Could our idea of hope be empty. Peepin has often said about me, I'm one of those pause and think preachers, that I get, I have people to pause and to think about the Christian journey. Well, this is what I'm doing today. I can think of two kinds of hope. On one hand, we have the conservative kind of hope. It's the hope that if we ask the, in the right way, with enough faith in our hearts, God will fix 
problems, heal diseases, and right wrong. God will crash in and everything will be all right. The problem is, I have seen too many desperate prayers go unanswered to believe that could be true. On the other hand, there is a naive hope. Road-weary activists tend to call liberal idealism. This is the kind of hope that claims if we just love one another, if we are just kind, if we go vote, et cetera, et cetera, then things will be better and everything will be all right. The problem here is, I have seen too many liberals, myself included, too paralyzed by the comforts of the system, too segregated from those they claim to serve, to make any kind of dis discernible difference. Sure, both of these kinds of hope have merit. There is wisdom to recognize in what is beyond your control, and there is wisdom in recognizing the power of love and kindness to bring out the best of people. Both are important, but when it comes to the full, the full depth of human suffering, in the end, both are insufficient. For me, both shattered in the face of pain, I saw that day in the museum. Both were exposed to different kinds of escapism, a vain hope, everything will be okay, maintained by a buffer a privilege. The truth is many, far too many, who live and die in poverty and pain with no hope to speak of. For many of us this year has shown us just how fragile that kind of hope can be. So this year, we must ask, could our idea of hope be empty? Maybe, probably, but here's the thing. These cheap hopes do not discount the existence of true hope any more than cheap romance novels discount the existence of true love. The truth is, real hope, just like real love, has a higher cost. For that kind of hope, we need to turn to the Christ story. If we were awarding Pulitzer for, top, for photography in the first century, and a photographer had managed to snap a picture of Christ as a child, what do you think they would have captured? The iconographers would have us believe that we would have seen a serene child, a regal child sitting in, on the lap of his straight-faced, hollowed mother. But honestly, I think we should be suspicious. Is this the image of a child born so poor, his birth took place in a stable alongside the livestock? 
Is this the image of a child born into a nation shadowed by an imperial superpower, crucifying any who dare to speak a word of resistance? With respect to the iconographers, I think Christ would have looked far more like these children from Vietnam or Sudan. Children born into poverty, pain, and hopelessness. And yet, and yet, the Christ story is somehow a story of unparalleled hope. The Christ story is not one of resignation or depression, but one of a man's holding leopards in his arms, preaching relentless liberation and marching boldly towards a Roman cross, holding his executioners in his heart. How? Andrew Lester says that when we look into our imagined future stories and see only pain, that we are paralyzed by fear, by despair. But in the Christ story, I think we see that this isn't the whole picture. In the Christ story, we see that when we are hopeless, when we have the courage to look despair in the eye, the courage not to look away, then we discover we have not a limitation, but a superpower, desperation. The story of Christ is a story of one who looked deeply into his hopelessness in stopping his own impending crucifixion and hopelessness of the nation around him who looked into a future that ended unavoidably in pain and death. Yet, it set him free. It set him free to do things most never find the courage to do, to love people most think are too dangerous to love, to work for a future that went beyond his own life. He became, in the words, often attributed to Oscar Romero, the prophet of a future not his own. Seeing no hope in his desperation, he died to himself and let the God and him run loose in the world. This is the real hope, earn hope. The hope can only be found along the road of honest hopelessness. If we want real hope, lasting and unfragile, it can only be found by looking hopelessness in the eye, by walking through the gallery of human suffering, sitting and waiting. It can only come through a recognition that thousands of child, children will die of hunger and preventable causes today, today. It can only come through meaningful contact with the countless children in the United States who will be denied quality education, who will be denied quality employment, sentenced to a life of suspicion and violence for having had the audacity to be born poor. It can only come from opening your hearts to the millions of people in the United States and in our global community who have died of COVID, 
19. Having faced a decision to either go to a job that offers no protection or come home to an eviction notice attached to the door. It can only come from the honest acceptance of the now unstoppable effects of climate change, calling into question the very survival of our species. It can only come when we recognize the demeaning and deteriorating and devastating effects of war. It comes when we are woke to the unimaginable reality Ukraine is facing today. How? Real lasting hope can never come from easy answers, escapism, or naive idealism. Hope comes from a journey into the very heart of hopelessness itself. It comes from the hopelessness of Christ who gives birth to despair, who gives birth to desperation, then to the total freedom to do what must be done, to, a God, to allow God to live through you, to become the prophet of a future that is not your own, the future of a new heaven and a new earth. There's a hope through hopelessness, life through a cross. It is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to all being saved, it is the very power and wisdom of God. So, people of God, on this Sunday, on this Sunday, as you celebrate your pastor being here with you, as you and the people journey through the uncertainty of current events, waiting for the light, may we be consistently dissatisfied with empty hope, with any hope that is fragile or threatened by suffering. I want to leave you with another photograph, a more recent photograph. Baby strollers line up one after another at the train station in Poland. Mothers of Poland left strollers for mothers from Ukraine to use as they continued their freedom journey. May we have the courage to embrace the hopelessness of Christ, looking deeply at that which we would rather look away from or explain away. So we may find the desperation, the liberation, the freedom of Christ. May we live resurrected lives in the service of a kingdom greater than ourselves. May it be so. Amen. It is time for our offering of thanks. We are grateful for any donations that we receive. Your offerings help to grow the kingdom of God here on earth. There are several ways to give. There's a button on the church's website Use the tithe.ly app or scan the QR symbol on the back of this bulletin or place a gift in one of the baskets at the church. 
You may send a donation by mail, but as always, please know this is an opportunity to give, never an obligation. This is the type of church to give you a shout. <laughs> oh, just give me a moment. We give thanks for our offering. Gracious God, the gifts we bring are but a small portion of the bounty we receive from you. And we give them in gratitude for everything we have. Bless now these gifts and those we bring and those who bring them, as well as those who will receive them and grant that they may be used to make our community a kinder and more compassionate place. Through Jesus Christ who calls us to be repairers of the world. Let's prepare for our closing hymn. Won't you let me be your servant?
Now as we go out into the world and bear witness to the love of God in Jesus Christ, though our world is filled with sadness and suffering, though the peace we desire for our world escapes us. Remember that God in Jesus Christ grants a peace that the world can neither give nor take away. Live now in the depths of that peace and pass it on to a world sorely in need. May we accept God's blessings.